Yeah, thank you, Nikos. Um, so I have given a, a variation of this talk before. Um, it was mostly the same, but the only difference was that it was called something. There were no graphs before. And so because of the spirit of Christmas, I have changed the tree. But the picture was there, so that's a tree. And it's still the same. And what I want to talk about, talk about is joint work with these guys. So one of them is Charles Bordenau, who is in Toulouse and Arnav Sen, who is in, in Minnesota. Um, and uh, let's see. So there is a quote, colors blind the eye, sounds deaf in the ears. It's from Lodza, from the from Tata King or Dada King, from the 6th century BC. Uh, yeah, this, is, uh, this is, goes on about other things that uh, you know, sort of distract you from the essence of the essence of things, but 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 what you know, the moral I want to take from this is that spectral properties have always been important. Okay. So um, so we're going to, to we talk. Well, I'm going to talk about spectral properties, uh, such as colors and sound, and electricity. All of these things are somehow related to to spectra. And more more precisely, I'm going to talk about uh, the spectra of graphs and trees. So so what do I mean by that? Well, you have a graph, some kind of a graph. Let's say first a finite graph. And then you can um, you can associate with this graph uh, an adjacency matrix. Right? So you say Aij is equal to one if, if Ij is an egg and zero otherwise. So what is this? This is a symmetric matrix. Automatically symmetric, so you can so it, so it has an ortho, <coughs> an orthonormal basis of eigenvalues if it's a finite matrix. Uh, so so you can always uh, uh, decompose it as a sum of you know Franklin projections and so on. But and these eigenvalues they tell you a lot about the structure of the graph. So. So there are many, many things that you can compute from eigenvalues of this matrix or some variation of it. For example, you could compute the number of spanning trees. That's, that's one thing. You can compute many things about matchings, perfect matchings in the graph. You can compute, uh, say things about uh, how if you do a random walk on, on, this, on this graph, you can, you can compute things about how fast you will get lost, basically, which means that how fast you forget where the random walk started from. Uh, so this is sort of the mixing time. All these things are kind of spectral properties that you can actually just look at the spectrum and tell quite a lot about. Um, one of the interesting things is that that this fact is you know, not, not true anymore for uh, infinite graphs. So, so for example, <coughs> the graph of Z yeah, this is this is still you know you could think of it as an infinite by infinite matrix. It's a Jason matrix, and it's still uh, a self-adjoint operator on middle attitude of, of the vertices. Uh, but it has no eigenvectors at all. Okay, so what are eigenvectors? Well, eigenvectors are vectors in here uh, which satisfy the eigenvalue equation. Right? So a b is not a b group for for some for some lambda. And uh, you know, if you if you write down what this means here, right, it, it tells you that. Let's see. So so if you take v, it tells you that v of x times lambda, right? That's the that's the right hand side. Is is v of x minus one plus v of x plus one. Okay. This is a this is a three term recursion. So. So this will have a, a solution, a space of solutions which is two-dimensional, and uh, any, anything, it's a linear recursion, so any linear combination of solutions will still be solutions. You have a two-dimensional space of solutions, typically, and you can just write down the solution. So, so the ones that are, so either we have something exponential, so e to the, e to the gamma x is going to be some solution of this, and e to the minus gamma x as well, and it's going to be also a solution if gamma is uh, if gamma is complex. Uh, 
And anything that's, that looks a bit like an eigenvalue are the ones which are e to the i alpha x. Their alpha is a real number, plus e to the right. So, so this is going to be uh, an eigenvector. Okay? And this conjugate is going to be an eigenvector. It's real and, uh, and real and imaginary parts are both going to be uh, uh, satisfying this equation. But of course, these are not in L2. Okay? So they're, they're because this is not square sum of it. And basically, you exhaust all the solutions by, by these guys. So there's, there cannot be any solutions that are not. So, so that's, uh, and, and you know, what do these, and these are the things that are sort of what you have instead of eigenvectors, and they're called, uh, in this world, they're called extended states. Okay, so, so the real part of this is just cosine, so you take a cosine function with any uh, amplitude, and the sample of these discrete places. So it's going to be, you know, you just take this function, and then you just take the values at the discrete points, and that's going to be one of the eigenvectors for some eigenvectors. Right. Um, now, if it, had an, if it had an eigenvector in L2, then of course it wouldn't look like this, it couldn't extend so far. That's why this is called extended. It would be more like localized, right? You expect it to be living at some particular place. And the fact that it's so extended is, you could think of it as a, as a uh, that you have these long, long waves, you can think of it that, that, that the Z copy of Z is a wire, okay? and this wire can conduct electricity. The reason it can conduct electricity is because you have these long waves. If you want to be more precise in this, then you have to write down the wave equation, and then the, wave, the, the solution of the wave equation you can do by decomposing it into eigenfunctions or these extended states, and then you will actually get the same thing. The main idea you should keep is that the fact that you have these long, Long AM vectors it essentially makes it conduct electricity. Now, of course, this is very nice. This is a very nice and perfect one-dimensional lattice, this Z. And this is not what we have in real life. Right? So usually, we don't have these materials perfect. You have some, some blemishes in these materials. So what physicists thought of, of doing is, instead of just using this as a model of wire, uh, uh, they decide, okay, let's do a little bit of perturbation. So you take this adjacency matrix A and add to it, this is called the Anderson model, uh, some diagonal matrix. Okay, so it's just a diagonal matrix where you put, uh, I don't know, V1, V2, uh, and so on. VK, it's an infinite by infinite diagonal matrix. But <coughs> uh, these Vs are IID. Independent identical, identical distributed and random uh, perturbations. What perturbation means is that they are small. Okay, so you can take them as small as you want. And what the physicists have observed is that it's this amazing thing that no matter how small you make this IID perturbation, you cannot make it zero, but you can make it any any smaller random, you know, coin toss with uh, so plus or, minus, plus or minus one over a million, it probably can have each, this is perfect. Uh, what's going to happen is that there are no more wave functions like this. They're just going to completely disappear. What you'll have instead is, is, is localized stuff. Okay? So you have eigenfunctions functions of this sort. In fact, this operator A plus B, it's probably the one, it's a random operator, right? Because uh, at A, the adjacency matrix, I think this is random. And with probability one, it will have a complete basis of eigenfunctions. Okay, so you go from here, no random <coughs> functions at all, just a tiny bit of randomness, you have a complete basis right away. And so this is a, you know, this, if you, if you can think, this is why you need actually thick wires to conduct electricity. Okay, the, the wires, when you, when you conduct more electricity, you have to make the wires thicker, because this, uh, uh, you know, just, uh, if it does only small wires, it won't work. Um, but the mathematical justification of why thick wires actually work uh, is still not there. So, so in fact, what is believed, and this is, I could say it's probably the most important open problem in mathematical physics, is the following, is if you take the, the grid, and this is the three-dimensional grid now, okay, um, and you do the same thing, then if the noise is small enough, then you will still have these long extended uh, eigenfunction. This is called the extended space conjecture. Um, 
So, uh, in mathematics, it's a conjecture. In, in physics, uh, it is a theorem. But, <laughs> but you know, in physics, uh, theorems mean in different things. So, so, physicists actually sort of assign a kind of degree of how much they believe in something. And this one actually has a relatively, you know, the, every, they believe that it's true, but that the proof that is given, they believe, well, okay, it's not, it's kind of a proof, but not a very good one. Um, Does the proof make sense to you? Any sense? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. But it, but it has, uh, but uh, yeah, but it's it's not just that it it it, it, miss, it misses the, some steps, but it's it, there's just too much unjustified intuition in the proof. Um, so in fact, it's so bad that in z squared, which is two dimensions, you don't know what the answer is. So, so you know, you could say that mathematicians and you don't even there aren't really good guesses. So it's not clear whether you could make wires out of uh, tin foil. It's a two-dimensional one. Now there is another model of another model of this uh, electrical conductance, which is similar to this. Which is you take this works better in. In, in you know higher dimensions like z squared and z cubed, um, and it's called quantum percolation. Okay, so what is percolation? Well, you have this, you have this uh, grid uh, in uh, some dimension, and let's say that you take, you put uh, just a coin for each vertex. Okay, with probability hat p. Okay, so p can be any number, fixed number between zero and one. And if the and if the coin comes up heads, you say, okay, you're very you very nice, you're gonna stay here. If it's tails, you say, no, you're gone. Okay, so so basically you're erasing erasing all vertices that came up tails. And if p is very close to one, then what you see, you know, one minus one over a billion. Then, then you pretty much you see the same, the whole lattice with some blemishes every now, every, every, every now and then. And if it's close to zero, then you see almost nothing. So, so you could ask, you know, what is the, what, what do you know about the waves in this, the waves in the main functions in this lattice? And the answer is, you know, we, we know almost nothing. It's a completely open, open problem. We don't know if they're extended or localized. We don't know if this, there is an out of basis of eigenfunctions. You will know pretty much nothing. It's, it's, it's a very uh, interesting and open area. So, so this this model, by the way, was was introduced in this paper in '59, Jean Lafour and Mio, <coughs> and they ask, and it was very shortly after this perturbative method model, which is the Anderson model, which if you see any you know, in, in math physics, this is extremely famous, and the Hammersley model of percolation. So percolation was also introduced. Uh, two years before this paper, and and what is believed? It's, it's it's quite interesting. So if you go to z cubed, okay, then you remember as you increase b, you have more and more more and more vertices in your in your cluster. And of course, this p is very small, and you won't even have infinite components. Then you just have a bunch of vertices floating around. So. Of course, if there, is, if there are no infinite components, then there won't be these extended states. Um, the interesting belief is that, that, that there is a space. So if you, if you increase p, there is a critical point where you have infinite components. That's called, that's called pc over there. It's about 0 0.24. And then there is supposed to be a region when there is nothing, when there is no, still infinite components, but there are no extended <coughs> states. So all the eigenvectors are small. And then there is a, a new, uh, another value, which is the quantum percolation threshold, PQ. We, and above that, you will see some extended states. That's, that's the belief in this picture. But, but again, this is, this is completely open. This is for CQ or this squared? This is for CQ. For Z squared, you know, it's very ambiguous. They, most people believe that there, there are never extended states in Z squared. But, but it's not human list. Okay. So in 1973, uh, these, these two guys, Kirkpatrick and Agarder, have studied this question and, and they basically classified the eigenvectors into three places according to what I just said, the three classes. 
So one kind of eigenvectors are the ones that live on finite clusters, right? When you have a finite component, then there are eigenvectors there. They're not super interesting, they're just eigenvectors of finite graphs. And then the, uh, the second one, they are eigenvectors which are which live on infinite clusters, so very big clusters, but they are finitely supported. Okay, so that means that means they just live on some finite part of the graph and outside it's completely zero. Okay? And the third kinds are the ones that live on infinite clusters, and they're infinitely supported, so that you cannot localize them to a finite place. And <coughs> the fourth kind is, is, is the non L2 eigenvector, so they're not really eigenvectors in these extended states. Um, the problem is that, you know, one thing I will tell you quickly is that there are, of course, first, on finite clusters you will have eigenvectors. That's clear that one exists. Uh, the fact that two exist, I will tell you, uh, that's actually uh, not so hard to see. I mean, we will see some pictures that there are eigenvectors on the infinite clusters that are themselves finitely supported. Whether three exists or not, it's still open. Okay? Uh, and whether four, four exists, it's of course very open. I just told you that. This is the, almost the extended space conjecture. Um, so, so what we actually can prove is that either three or four exists. Okay, and then I will tell you why. Um, here, what is the universe? Z cubes here? Or this actually, for us, it's z squared. Z squared. This is true in any z, z, okay, z, z to the k, but we can prove it for z squared. Um, so, there is a, some observation, and I'll say about that, that when you have eigenvectors that are infinite clusters and they're finitely supported, uh, then they correspond to some, some fixed configuration in the graph. Uh, so, correspond to some fixed finite uh, part of the graph that you see many, many places because it's a population, so everything is copied many, many places everywhere. And and because it's a finite graph, you know, it's supported in a finite piece of the graph, it's an eigenvalue of some finite graph. There only comes count of many such things, eigenvalues of, of finite graphs in this. Sure, right? So so it somehow has to be one of those count of fixed quantum of many things. So, so, so these infinite clusters correspond to these fixed eigenvalues that are one of these countably many options. <coughs> um, a little bit harder to see, but, but it's still true that if you have uh, inf infinitely supported eigenvectors, then it's, their eigenvalues have to be kind of random. You cannot say it's going to be here. But it has to be somehow smeared out, the distribution. Uh, that's, that's another interesting fact. Okay. So how do we how do we study these eigenfunctions and eigenvectors? One of the nice tools is, is it's called a spectral measure. Okay, so it's a measure that you associate uh, with a graph in the vertex, or generally uh, uh, an operator in a vector. So if you learn spectr the spectral theorem, it's easy to define. But I don't I don't, I don't uh, assume that you guys all know the spectral theorem. So so. So here is the definition. Okay? So if you have uh, an operator A, or you can think of it as an infinite by infinite matrix, you can like, take its kth power, <coughs> and let's say that you have a special vertex O. Okay, so so for example, if you have an adjacency operator like that of Z, then you can compute its kth power because remember counting doing powers of, of graphs is just counting paths basically. So the OO entry of the kth power is just is exactly the number of paths of length k that go from O to O. So that's, that's what it is. And, and we say that this is a probability measure whose kth moment, okay, so it's a probability measure whose kth moment is exactly that. So if you integrate x to the k against it, then it's, it's exactly that. Okay? For a finite graph, there is another formula, but it only works for finite graphs. For finite graphs. Okay, you can write, write this as uh, so sigma is actually an atomic measure and is supported on the eigenvalues. So you sum over the eigenvalues. What do you put there? So you put the delta mass of the eigenvalue. But, but it's, not, it's not just counting the eigenvalues. It's not the measure that counts the eigenvalues. That's an important measure, but it's not, this is not that. 
it actually cares a little bit about this, this vertex. Oh, so it's, so it's special to that vertex. And so you put here a, a, a coefficient, which is you look at the, the eigenfunction corresponding to lambda, normalized so that this has length 1, and you look at its entry at all and you square it. Okay, so that, that's, that's the spectrum measure. So so you so you so you that so the other one should be one. Okay, so it's, it's normalized by the square of the eigen function. So every eigenvalue gets as much weight as the corresponding eigen function puts on this vertex. So can someone have some kind of participation? Okay. So, so I have a question. So if you have a graph, so that's, this is sigma low, okay? So if you have a graph and you compute this sum, so you take these measures, and you, uh, these are probability measures, and you add them uh, according to over all the vertices of G. Uh, what are you going to get? Well, what is it? Anybody? The number of vertices. The number of vertices. But well, it's going to be a measure. It's a sum of measures. Right. So that's, that's right. Its total mass is the number of vertices. But but it's still a measure. So it, but it's actually just the eigenvalue counting measure. So it's a measure on the real line. which counts in every set. It tells you how many eigenvalues there are. And why is that? Because these guys form an orthonormal basis. Right. And so, in particular, they're of length 1. So, when you add this over all O, you get the relative norm squared, which is 1. So, so, it's, so, it's just kind of, so you can see that this is a localized version of the eigenvalue counting measure. And so, it's very simple, and it's not so hard to check. It's a nice exercise that this also holds for finite graphs. But an infinite graph, there may not be eigenvalues, so this doesn't make any sense. So you can do it either through the spectral measure, or you can do it like that. And for example, for, example, for, for this Z, uh, the spectral measure is, is non-atomic. Okay, so it's, it's actually just the arc sign distribution. So the spectral measure for Z looks like this. It's uh, 1 over 2 minus x squared, something like this. Um, some some small over pi like that. That's the that's the spectral measure for Z. Okay. So now the nice thing about the spectral measure is that there you can tell uh, from the spectral measure whether there are eigenvectors or not. Okay. So so here is the correspondence. You have an atom in sigma at the point X. So an atom in the measure is, is you know a point mass like this delta lambda. If and only if there is an L2 eigenvector uh, uh, with eigenvalue x, which charges the point O, that is non zero at the point O. Okay, so, so notice that for Z, for example, it follows from this correspondence and from the measure that I told you that there are no eigenvectors. Because this has no atoms, of course, it's a continuous measure. And, and this is this is at O, but of course that is translation invariant, so all the spectral measures are the same. That every vertex is the same thing. So there are no so no eigenvectors charging any vector vertex, so there's just no eigenvectors, period. Okay, and here I just told you, here is another remark, which is what I told you, that for finite graphs, the eigenvalue distribution, which is like the normalized eigenvalue counting measure, normalized to be a probability measure, <coughs> but it's just the expectation or the average of these averages of these spectral measures, expectation of sigma over, cho over choosing a random vertex. Okay, so, so this thing is, is sometimes called, in physics they call this thing the integrated density of states, if you ever bump, bump, bump into some physics paper on this. And, and again, the expected spectral measure for finite graphs is just the, the empirical eigenvalue distribution, the thing that puts mass 1 over n on every eigenvalue. And then there is this very nice fact that 
this expected spectral measure is, convergent, is, is, is continuous until under local convergence. So what does this mean? Uh, there is this nice notion of convergence of graphs. So if you have a sequence of graphs, for example, circles, Okay, and let's say that you have some root for each graph. And then we say that, and, and so, so these are circles of, of, of length n, so let's call them zn. Okay. So, so if there is some root, then what happens is that if you fix the neighborhood of the root, then eventually, as n goes to infinity, some size, some, some radius r, eventually as n goes to infinity, the, the neighborhood of this root looks like a neighborhood of z. Right, because they're getting bigger and bigger. So that means we say that Zn converges to Z uh, locally. Okay. And then there is a, so this is the local convergence, and then there is another convergence called Benjamin-Nichon convergence, where you have a sequence of fixed graphs. Okay. And then uh, you pick your root at random, you pick a, a random point in it, and see what you see around. So you see now a random graph. It's random rooted graph because, because the root is picked at random. Otherwise, it's not random. <coughs> and then you say the graph sequence converges to uh, a limiting random, random rooted graph if what you see around the root in distribution, uh, so the statistics of what you see around the root uh, for every radius, converges to the same thing in the limit. Okay, so that's, this is a very nice, nice thing. And, uh, uh, and this uh, integrated density of states is continuous under, under this convergence. So if you have a sequence of graphs, if Benjamin Nishan converges to another, to, to some limiting graph, then the integrated density of states also converges. So that's one way to get this arc sign distribution, by the way. Because the eigenvalues of Zn, you can write down uh, explicitly. It's a simple computation, it's just a tridiagonal matrix, right? Uh, almost tridiagonal, it's a circular matrix. Uh, its eigenvalues are uh, the real parts of twice the real parts of roots of unity, um, and and the distribution of that converges to our arc sign. It's so easy to check. Um, so, so the fact that these things converge is 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 not not a hard fact. A slightly harder fact that they converge in a very strong sense. Okay, and they converge in the sense that. That even if you have some atoms, like you fix some fixed fixed point, like half, and you see how much weight that uh, mass puts on one half, that weight also converges. Okay, uh, this is not uh, automatic from the convergence of measures. If you have, if you have seen things like that before, this is this is a, a much stronger fact, and it's called Lick approximation theory. Um, Okay, and um, so let's 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 go on. <coughs> so, so if you go back to this to this 1973 paper and let's interpret in terms of the spectral measure, then these are these two kinds of eigenvectors, the one that live on finite clusters and the one which are at fixed places. Okay. Um, they correspond to atoms in this integrated density of states or, or expected spectral measure. Okay, so the expected spectral, spectral measure for this model is some fixed deterministic measure, and and uh, and as a fixed deterministic measure, you can always write it as some atoms plus some some continuous part, an atomic part and the continuous part, and the atomic parts com, 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 com correspond to this case one two, and the continuous part corresponds to three or four. That's, that's the spec. So, so what we set out to prove is that there is, that in these measures, there is actually some continuous parts. It's not just atoms. There is something more than the, there is a little bit more than atoms. Okay. So I'll tell you. Yeah. So here is, here are two theorems that that I want to mention. Uh, the, the second one is this. Think about z squared. So if you have percolation on z squared or an infinite regular tree, and it's supercritical, so what does that mean? It means that there are, there exist infinite clusters. Then 
Then we actually, uh, in the eigenvalue distribution or in this expected spectral measure, there, are, there is some continuous part. So that's, that's the third. <laughs> And then there is another theorem which is about Erdős Rennie graphs. So I, I should tell you a little bit about that because it's a nice, uh, it's a nice history to this. It's a nice history. Um, so how many of you have heard about Erdős Rennie graphs? Okay, so so a lot of people. <laughs> so Erdős Rennie graphs are just random graphs, right? It's a JSON matrix. It's just a, a, a random symmetric, symmetric matrix. So each vertex is, or each entry, the diagonals are say zero, and each, each entry is chosen from the Bernoulli P distribution independently, except this thing has to be symmetric. Hmm? So it's a random matrix. And you know, these random matrices, like this random symmetric matrices, have a long history. So they're actually first considered in the 20s by statisticians to, to, to try to understand random data. And they're kind of resurfaced in math physics and mathematics in the 50s because Wigner, uh, Eugene Wigner, <laughs> wanted to understand uh, how the energy levels of large, large uh, atoms are distributed. And they, you know, they, he looked at this picture, the energy levels are just some numbers. And he, wrote, he saw these points drawn, and, and what he saw is that they actually repel each other. They're not like random points, they like to be far away from each other. So, <coughs> you know, I, we, could, we could model these atoms, but they're very large, so they're complicated to model. So why don't you use some kind of statistical physics mo model method to, to model them, as opposed to model them deterministically? And so he said, well, okay, suppose that they behave like a random matrix. And let's look at the eigenvalues of this random matrix. And as it turns out, the eigenvalues of these random matrix is actually repel each other. And this was, you know, this was uh, conjectured in the 50s that they repel each other. And it was proved uh, a few years, few years later for, for matrices that have Gaussian entries. So instead of, instead of Bernoulli, you put Gaussian here. And for Bernoulli, it was open until about two or three years ago. So it's, it's a brand new thing that the people can do anything about Bernoulli. And this was the, the fact that you still have repulsion is, is proved by two groups of people. One of them is Terry Tao and Van Vuk, and the other is H.T. Uh, Yao and, and, and Laszlo Erdős. So both teams have Hungarians in that one. The, the Terry Tao Van Vu paper actually is <coughs> Van Vu on it with, with uh, who speaks pretty good Hungarian and to university here. So. Um, anyway, so, so going back to this Bernoulli P, uh, but what Wigner first said is, okay, let's try to understand how the eigenvalues are distributed on the large scale. And what he found is that when you draw, draw the histogram of the eigenvalues, you see a semicircle. Okay, so the histogram is like a semicircle, and this is called the Wigner semicircle law. And then people want to study repulsion, which happens on a very small scale. And this is, you see all the eigenvalues on this scale. If you want to study eigenvalues, repulsion, you have to just see a few of them and see how they behave next to each other. Uh, it's always, you always some, you prove some version of the semicircle law. You, you, you usually need to prove a very strong version, so that it's very precisely like a semicircle. And this actually is not so hard to prove even for this Bernoulli case. So that's, you could do that as an exercise, you know. Uh, but but then what's what's happening now is the frontier of things is is is, is a certain spe specific case of Weber string graphs where at n goes to infinity, so the size of the matrix goes to infinity, this p goes to zero. So this is the sparse case. Okay? And, and, and the idea is that n times p is going to some constant, or could even be equal to a constant c. So what does this mean? It means that uh, it means that the vertex has on average c neighbors. Roughly c neighbors. Um, so <coughs> uh, 
Yeah, so, so a vertex has roughly C neighbors, and and uh, you, you you study you want to understand what this what this case looks like. And when you draw the histogram for this, it doesn't look like that anymore. Okay, so for this particular case, when the graph is sparse, uh, what you see is you know some spikes. I don't know, you see something pretty crazy. <laughs> it doesn't look like a semicircle at all. And what you can show is that when MD goes to infinity, but when N goes to infinity, the, the, the spectral uh, expected spectral measure or the eigenvalue distribution, uh, sigma n, converges to some limit sigma. So that's that's not so hard to prove. But what the sigma looks like is pretty complicated. One thing that we will again show is that it has many, many atoms. So that's why you see spikes when you draw the picture. Okay, so it has lots of atoms. It's not smooth like a semicircle. And again, the question what we started to wanted to understand is, is, is there any continuous part? Is it all atoms, or is it, does it have anything, you know, any property like a semicircle that is some continuous part? And there is a nice story here, because you can understand this this, this limiting measure sigma in a different way. Different picture. Okay. So if you have a vertex, right, um, and look at its neighbors, well, it has some random number of neighbors. What is roughly the distribution of its neighbors? Well, if you look at it, it's, it's a sum of, of Bernoulli's, right? But those Bernoulli's are very small. They're 1 over p. And, and, and their sum is, uh, sum is expectation c. OK, so the number of, of, of neighbors is about the Poisson with, with parameter c. OK, if you, if you know probability, this is roughly this distribution. And then when you look at the next, the next uh, the vertices that are its neighbors, it's very unlikely that um, they are uh, connected to each other because there are few of them. But what's more likely is that you that they each have some Poisson number of neighbors that uh, that are independently chosen from each other. Okay. So this is how this, this graph behaves locally. And when n goes to infinity, uh, you, you, locally, <coughs> this local convergence, this graph, so the Erdős-Rényi graph with parameter uh, let's, let's call it C, converges to something called the Poisson Bottom Watson tree with parameter C, which is exactly what I described. This random tree where somebody, everybody has a Poisson number of neighbors, and then you have some kind of tree that grows like this. And you can check that, uh, you know, what's known about this Poisson tree is that if C is less than 1, then they're always finite. So then the average Schrenge graphs will, will only have small components. And if C is greater than 1, then with some probability it, they're infinite. So, so, you, so the average Schrenge graph then will have relatively large components. And this is fairly well understood. And from what I told you before, this, this analogy of the semicircle law in this case is just the expected spectral measure of this tree at the root. Okay, so this is the expected sigma O for the PGV tree. This is a nice random tree. Okay. Um, so, okay, so I, I told you about this, this model, the sparse Erdős-Rényi graphs. It's a random matrix model which you don't have a semicircle, but you have the same idea as a Wigner law. There is some limiting distribution, it's just not a semicircle. And people have studied this in the physics literature and so on, and they look could look like Poisson Gott and Watson trees. Okay, so, so this is the, all I wanted to say about story. And the rest, for, for a little bit, I'm going to do some math. Okay, so it's going to be proofs. Uh, so let me tell you one way of proving this kind of theorem. If I want to tell you whether there is a, an atom in a spectral measure of an infinite graph, then one thing I can do is approximate infinite graphs by finite graphs. For example, the percolation on the Z squared, I could approximate by percolation on boxes. 
And when you do this approximation, we have seen that the weight of atoms converge. Right? So if there will be an atom in the spectral measure in the limit, there has to be a heavy atom in the spectral measure before you take the limit. And what is a heavy atom? Well, the heavy atom is, means that you have an ideal value with high multiplicity. Okay? How high does the, does the multiplicity have to be? Well, it has to be a constant times the size of the graph. That's what you will see in the limit. If it's less than that, it will just disappear. Okay, so the question that you study in the finite case is you have some graph, is there an atom, is there an eigen by you whose multiplicity is or the order of the size of the graph? Um, okay, so, so we're going to show how you can bound this. Um, and here is a model that we can show, for example, that has no atoms at all. This is vertical percolation. So, it, so you look at z squared and you just erase some of the vertical edges uh, and you keep all the horizontal ones. We're going to show in a second that this model has absolutely no atoms. Um, so let's first look at bond percolation. Uh, what I claim is that there, in, in this model, in the limit, there are going to be some atoms. And why? So here is, the reason for this is called tuning fork. So what is a tuning fork? Well, uh, here is one. Okay, so this is an eigenvector here, with the eigenvalue zero. How does it look like? It puts, what does it look like? It puts one here and minus one there, puts zero in the middle, and puts zero everywhere else. Wherever I can try the number is zero. Why is it, why is it an eigenvector? But what does it mean to be an eigenvector with eigenvalue zero? It just means when you sum your neighbors, it will be zero. Okay? And, and then it happens here, right? It happens here, happens there, happens everywhere. So that's nice. So this is an eigenvector with eigenvalue zero. And why do you call it a tuning fork? Call it a tuning fork because it has the same property as a tuning fork. When you hold a tuning fork at its stem, right? It doesn't resonate. The thing that resonates are these, are these arms here. Right? So it basically, the reason the tuning fork works is because it has an eigenvector that vanishes on the, on, the, on the place that you hold it. That's why you don't use you know, sticks for tuning. Because you hold them, you would dampen the sound. Uh, so, so it's the same, kind of same idea. You have this tuning fork in this graph. And you see when you have a percolation in a huge cluster, you do this kind of percolation on a gigantic box, then you have tuning forks appear everywhere. Right? The number of such, such parts of the graph is some constant times the volume because of the, because of the percolation. So eventually, uh, so that means you have a multiplicity which you see times n squared. And not only that, but, but you can have tuning forks that are more complicated. Okay, so instead of, instead of having here some, just a vertex, you could have uh, a configuration where there is some g here and some g prime there. And as long as g and g prime have a common eigenvalue, then you can take this eigenfunction here, say that's lambda, then you can take the eigenfunction here with uh, positive sign and here, take the eigenfunction there with negative sign, uh, and you can adjust this so that it's going to be an eigenfunction of this, of this graph. So you can have more complicated tuning forks, and they'll work just as well. Okay, so basically what this shows is that any, any number that can be an eigenvalue of a finite graph, or a finite subset of this lattice, um, is going to be going to appear with um, in the spectrum and there's going to be uh, a point mass there. So, so from just from this argument, you will see that when you draw this expected spectral measure, so sigma of percolation, okay, it actually goes from minus four to four, I think. The, the, the spectrum is there, but in this. In this, in this interval, there's going to be a dense set of atoms. Okay, so there are going to be atoms everywhere. So, so if there is some continuous part, as I will show, but it's very, very hard to find this. In particular, you won't see it in pictures. But in pictures, what we only see are those little, little spikes. So that's why, that's why you have these you know, funny eigenvectors. I mean, this is, this, if you remember, but 
when they had this classification, this was the number two kind of eigenvectors. Okay, so here let me do some math. The last few minutes. Um, so, so I'm going to show here that we're going to show, and it's going to be really easy, that if you have an eigenvalue uh, in, in, the, in this n by n grid, then its multiplicity is at most n. Okay? And the volume is n squared, so, so there's going to be nothing that, that, can, that will survive in the limit. So why is that? So let's look at the proof. So let's, x is the eigenvalue, and let v be its eigenspace. So it's the space of vectors. We want to show that v is, the dimension of v is at most n. And let's look at this set of vertices. Okay? And let B be the space of function that vanishes on that set. Okay, so that's a linear space. Um, and now you look at the intersection of the two spaces. Okay? Um, and the intersection satisfies this inequality. The codimension of the intersection is less than or equal to the codimension of one plus the codimension of the other. This is just some standard facts. <laughs> uh, if they're linearly independent, then, then it's equality, but it's always less than or equal. Uh, and so the codimension of the space B, I know, um, because, because it's just the space of functions that vanish here, right? So its codimension is just given by the, the constraint that they have to vanish here, so it's n. Um, the codimension of V is n squared minus its dimension, let's call that m, the multiplicity of the eigenvalue. And so all I have to show is the codimension of this intersection is n squared. And then I have my inequality that m is less than or equal to n. So the codimension of the intersection n squared, that just means that this trace is trivial. Okay, so there is, there is a trivial subspace, this intersection. So why is this subspace trivial? Um, it's extremely easy. So let's, let's look at an element of this subspace, right? So what's an element of this subspace? On the one hand, it's an, eigen, it's, it's an eigenfunction, it's eigenvalue x, and on the other hand, it vanishes on this set. So, so you write the eigenvalue equation at this vertex b, okay? So what does that tell you? It tells you that the eigenvalue times the value here is the sum of the neighbors. So x times b is a plus c. But, but look at this, I mean, this is zero, that is zero, we already know. Okay, so C has to be zero. So in fact, this thing has to vanish at C as well, from this eigenvalue equation. And we can continue, right? It has to vanish all the time. And it has to vanish on the next one as well. And so on, it has to vanish everywhere, so it has to be zero. Okay, so it's a very simple proof that that uh, if you have uh, that, uh, that the multiplicity of anything in this any eigenvalue in this picture is at most n. So, so what what do we what did we get from this? We got automatically that that the spectral measure of this vertical percolation has no atoms at all. So let's uh, okay, let me skip this. And let me tell you what we proved actually. I mean, it's, 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 it's basically this proof that I gave you proves something, if you generalize it or just say it in more abstract terms, it, it tells you the following. So let's say uh, you have a G is a finite graph and you label its vertices with the integers. And then you can call a vertex a prodigy if, if, you, if you're able to zero it out, just like we zeroed out this, this, this vertex, remember, over here. So we, this, this vertex C, we managed to zero out, that's going to be a prod of prodigy. So when can we do that? Um, we, can, it can, we can do that if there is a neighbor whose label, so we, the label is going to be the, the time when we zero comes out. <laughs> so when can we zero out the vertex? Well, you can do it if it has a neighbor which we have already zeroed out, so it has a lower label. And also, all its other neighbors were already zeroed out. So all the other neighbors have to have lower label. And then the vertex that is not prodigy, we just call it bad, we're very strict. Uh, and then the theorem says that the multiplicity of any eigenvalue is at most uh, the number of bad vertices in this labeling. So that's, we essentially proved that by this argument. 
So for example, in this picture, the labels would be 0, 1, 2, and 3. Okay? And all the green ones are prodigies, and only the, the, the red ones are bad. Um, and then you can generalize it by, this is a trivial generalization. If I add the multiplicities of J eigenvalues, then it will be at most J times the bad vertices. Uh, and there's a some, somewhat less trivial generalization. Is it the same as saying that we in fact, the uh, subset of the vertices, and then once uh, once you are once you are a neighbor of someone whose all other neighbors are infected, then you get infected, and then infection spreads, and you want to infect the whole graph. Yes. And then you want the minimum number. Yes. Okay. From which the infection okay. spreads. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's a good way to think about it, right? Mm -hmm. And then it's clear that you can infect with the left hand side the whole board. Right. In this picture. Right. So if, if you have a neighbor who's infected, with all other neighbors that are infected, then you'll get infected. And then you just see how the infection spread. And then the bigger generalization, you allow a, a vertex to be level, which means uh, all the neighbors are, have the same label as it, as that. And you get to this kind of bound. So the multiplicity is j times but is the number of level vertices. OK, so I just get to the random trees. So I'm going to tell you how we do random trees, okay? So the theorem that I'm going to show you is how to use this, this little lemma that I told you about, the trees. Um, for example, this super this Poisson map of Watson trees that you get from the Erdos-Rini graph. So the result of that will be that, that this Erdos-Rini graph is, is the Swinger semicircle law that is the spiky, still has some continuous part. So it won't tell you that it's, it's completely continuous because it's false, but it has some continuous part. <coughs> so the first thing that you have to do is you have this Gautam Watson tree, and you have to do this kind of coloring. So you have to put these infinite lines in it in a nice and invariant way. Let me not tell you what that means. So that they don't intersect even in vertices. Okay, so, and they have to be with positive density. So you have to see them everywhere. Yeah, it's, let's call it density R. So the fact that you can do that is not completely obvious, but if you do these kind of things uh, for a living, you can probably do it. So, we have, we have an expert in, in Hungary on this guy. His name is Adam Tima. Uh, and I think you could do it in five minutes. Um, okay, so, so once you have put, so, so you put these lines and now you direct them at random. So if you toss a coin for each of them, and you're going to direct them in some direction. Okay. And now, what do you do? No, oh, this, is, this is too fast. So now you put uh, a function. Uh, okay, so you think of this as a, as a you, lay, you write a number one on each arrow, okay? And now you write a number zero on each edge, which has no error. So then you have an edge function, okay? Um, and this edge function is either, has its values is either 1 or 0. Uh, it can be a gradient of a vertex function. What does it mean? It means a gradient means just that the difference of the, of the values of the vertex function along the edge is just the number that you write on the edge. So now we're going to pick some big k, where k is some fixed integer, a large integer, and we're going to do this labeling mod k. So if you have this edge function, then mod k, they're exactly k functions of which this is the gradient. Why is that? Because if I tell you the value at the vertex, then the rest of it you can figure out by just summing along the edges, right? So here, for example, k equals 4, I guess. Yeah, 4. And, and you see, <coughs> if I determine this 1, then you know it has to be 2 because this difference has to be 1, and you know it has to be 1 here because this difference has to be 0, and so on. So there is a, once you fix a value, there is a unique function of which this is the gradient. <coughs> we're going to pick one of them at random. So each with probability 1 over k. So we have this nice label in the graph. And now you just have to count, uh, count prodigies and, and things like this. And it turns out, you know, uh, along these lines, all the vertices which are labeled, along the red lines, all the vertices which are labeled uh, I think 0 or 1 are bad, and everybody else are, are prodigies. 
And uh, those vertices which are not on red lines, there are such vertices too. They, are, they just turn out to be level when you do this legally. And, and using this, you can give this nice multiplicity bound. Um, there is a little bit of cheating because this is an infinite graph, so I skipped some limiting statements. But when you do this, this whole thing, you know, what you get is basically uh, the, the sum of the multiplicities of all the atoms is bounded above by 1 minus the density of these red lines. Okay, so, so, if the de so if the, de if the red lines are, are very dense, then, sorry, 1 minus, yeah, 1 minus the density of the de red lines. So if the red lines are very dense, then the sum of the multiplicities are very small. And, and since we can show that there is the red lines, they always exist in, this, in these trees, uh, the, the, the result is that you always have some continuous spectrum. So yeah, this is the this is the, the first theorem. <coughs> the other thing we did is, is we, we can prove on these that square that, that you have a continuous part in the in the spectrum, but that's uh, that's a slightly different story that I want to uh, um, Okay, so maybe I'll stop now uh, if you have some questions.